encourage us, that you would inspire us, Lord. I'm not worthy of that, Lord, but these are your people, and I ask that you would inspire them to make a difference in the lives of the people around them. Lord, we give you this time and invite you here in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so now my screen is being shared. So in preparation for this evening, I was thinking about uh, something Pastor Brent's been working with us on for the last few weeks is on the concept of we're supposed to be spurring one another on to love and to good deeds. We're supposed to be trying to encourage and bring out the very best in the people around us. And related to that, I thought about the topic of mentorship. And I like to think of mentorship as being like a very strong rope. A rope that, according to the Bible, is not easily broken. Because, you know, one of the things that we can face in our lives is when we are standing alone on our own strength, our own ability, our own wisdom, our own intellect, we can make a lot of mistakes. But if we're surrounded by other people that are of like mind, like heart, that we can trust, we can uh, share life with, we can journey together with, we find that when we are feeling weak, they can strengthen us and help sustain us. We are benefited by the friendship of those that are close with us. And so uh, a key verse for this evening, Ecclesiastes first, uh, chapter 4, verse 12. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Now, so the first image is a person standing alone on their own. Um, they can easily be surrounded, and uh, they may gain the upper hand for a while, but they can easily be overcome and, and conquered. But then when you have another person, you can stand back to back. Uh, one facing this way, one facing that way, and... If an enemy comes from a different side, you can turn a little bit and you can you can uh, sway. And so you're protecting each other. You know, I've got your back. In fact, in uh, fighter pilot circles, that's one of the, you know, one of the great things is I've got your six. I'm looking out for what's behind you. Um, we need that in our lives. We need the protection of other people around us. But best of all, it tells us here that when we stand together with a third person, now, in a marriage covenant, that's very simple. It's the husband, the wife, and God making a threefold strand that cannot be easily broken. Because when he's feeling strong, she can be weak and vulnerable. Or if she's having a wonderful day and he's struggling, they can encourage each other. And there's a great stability, of course, as God never has a bad day. He can always be relied upon to provide that strength. So... Um, but that's what we need in our own lives, is we need people that we can depend upon to uh, share the burden, the load together with. Because when we are partnering together in that, we are much stronger together than we ever could be on our own. And so one of the verses that came to mind is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Jesus sending out his disciples. And one of the things I've learned a long time ago is if you're sharing from the Bible, if you go with the things that Jesus said and the things that he did, nobody wants to argue with that. So if Jesus did it, I believe there's tremendous wisdom in it. It says here that the Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them out in pairs to, to, all, the towns and pla excuse me, to all the towns and places that he planned to visit. When Jesus, he called the disciples together, sending them now out as his ambassadors, but he sent them out in pairs. Two people traveling together because they could verify the same gospel message as each other. They could stand together. They could encourage each other. Um, and hopefully they'd be smart enough that uh, if they're getting a little bit lost, they neither one would be more stubborn than the other. They both could pause and ask for a little guidance. Okay, how do I go find Nazareth? Um, but Jesus, in sending out people, sent them out two by two. And these were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. And this is one of the key things that when uh, Jesus speaking, he is crediting that the uh, people to receive the gospel message belong to the Lord. Is saying, you know, that uh, it belongs to him, the message belongs to him, 
The people that are to be reached belong to him, and those workers belong to him. We belong to Jesus, and he has the right to send us out. We are his ambassadors, appointed to share his good works and his good deeds, his encouragement, his heart, his love to the people around us. But when we do it, it's his message to his people. And uh, one thing that's so, that I'm so mindful of um, is that every person is created in the image of Almighty God. Every single one of us. We all belong to him. Whether some people realize it or not, they truly belong to God. And when we interact with them, we should do so with the dignity and respect that comes from knowing that they are a child of the living God. Verse 3 Jesus' instructions continue. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. There's a big reason why Jesus didn't send them out alone. He knew that they would face opposition. He knew that they would be in situations they didn't want to be in. And at those moments, the togetherness, the partnership, could provide the strength they needed to stand fast, to be mutually encouraged, to carry on faithfully together. There was going to be hostility out there, and Jesus knew it. And he didn't tell them to go avoid the hostility. He told them to lean into that tension of that moment, to know that God was with them, and together they could carry out his, uh, his work. Now, a passage that uh, is near and dear to my heart, the Great Commission. As some people have said, it's not the Great Suggestion, but it's a commission given by Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. It was just before Jesus was raised up to heaven. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And that's one thing that I think is absolutely priceless, to understand that Jesus is our real authority. Um, yes, we are accountable to our bosses, we are accountable to uh, the leaders that have been appointed over us, our elected officials. We are, you know, if we live in a homeowners association area, we are held by some of the covenants that we've made in that. But our real authority, our real owner, if you would, is Jesus himself. And it says that he wasn't given a limited authority. He wasn't given a partial thing. He was given all authority in heaven and on earth. That's my Jesus. He says, then go, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They were sent forth with a message, but just speaking the gospel, just sharing the good news isn't enough. Their challenge was to make disciples, to encourage other people to come and develop a relationship with God based on that trust, accepting the sovereignty of the Lord in their lives, being willing to be transformed into the image of God. But the cool thing about that transformation is the Lord's the one who really works it within us. He takes us flawed human beings, and he works in us to want new things, to become better people, more like himself. And he challenges us and gives us the great opportunity to do the same thing in the lives of other people. We can make disciples. It can't be done in my strength or your strength. But we partner with God to bring hope where there is no hope, to bring encouragement, to bring joy. And we bring, you know, awareness. We become, you know, we become aware of our sins, our failings, our weaknesses. We bring awareness so that people can overcome being forgiven of their sins and transformed to become more like God. And then he goes further and says to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And here is that threefold partnership in, in play. There is God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus Christ our Lord, and God the Holy Spirit, who is the comforter that remained behind. Even after Jesus was raised to heaven, the Holy Spirit remained to inspire us, to raise us up, to bring about greater things through us than we could ever do it in our own strength. So even in the Godhead, there's a threefold entity. And I can't explain it thoroughly. 
I know that there's an absolute partnership and cooperation, and that little picture is part of what God wants for our lives, that we would come together with like-minded people for mutual encouragement, mutual strength, mutual unity and agreement to become a mutual blessing to the people around us. And in verse 20, he goes on and says, and teach these new disciples. And that's a beautiful thing, a new disciple. I think there's nothing more beautiful than somebody who's just recently come to God and is excited about everything. That they, every time they open God's word, they see something new there and fresh, and they feel as if it's written just for them. That's a beautiful thing that God does in their lives. These new disciples get uh, to obey all the commands that I have given you. And be sure of this, that I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that age is not over yet, friends. We are still living in that age. Jesus promises to still be with us in the midst of things, uh, to give us the hope to walk with us. We weren't abandoned, but we are accompanied in all that we do and all that we say as we fill, uh, fulfill this commission. And then another example from the book of Acts this is really getting to the heart of what God put on my heart, is the example of the Apostle Paul, how he lived his life. And it says in Acts chapter 11, verse 25 through 26, Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching, a lar teaching large crowds of people. And it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Paul, in his ministry, may never have really gotten off the ground if he hadn't had Barnabas come alongside and speak into his life, brought him some encouragement, saw a God-given giftedness within, um, within Paul, saw that he had a heart for the Lord, a tremendous understanding of the scriptures, and he saw something there that Paul's past, which was mixed with Great zeal for God, but great lack of care and concern for others along the, at the same time. Barnabas saw through that and saw potential there, saw those giftings, and he partnered with the Lord to bring Paul alongside, teaching alongside Paul, mentoring him, giving him encouragement, probably giving him some advice along the way. You know, it's like, Hey, brother, you may want to mellow out in this area. You know, step it on toes. It's good to step on them a little bit, but maybe you don't want to step on them too much. But he came alongside Paul and helped Paul grow into the ministry that he was later to, uh, to carry out. And there came a point in time where the two of them were sent out by the Holy Spirit together on the first missionary journey. They went together as partners sharing the gospel. And then it was through that experience that over time, Paul eclipsed. Barnabas became more influential and more well respected and known. It's not that Barnabas was any less, but it was through that discipleship and mentoring that Paul was able to rise up to become the influential leader that he was through the uh, insight of this mentor that looked out for him and brought out the best within him. And going on, here's what t Paul did later in Acts chapter 16. There's a young man named Timothy, and Timothy was well thought of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium. So Paul wanted him to join them on their journey. Paul saw a giftedness in this younger man, Timothy. He saw the respect, the way that uh, Timothy interacted with people. He knew that he had a godly heritage um, with his mom and his grandma. So he reached out and brought Timothy under wing. And in fact, we have a couple of books within the Bible that are written as letters to encourage Timothy for the ministry that he carried out as a, a bishop or a leader. So Paul learned from somebody, was discipled and mentored by Barnabas, and he in turn reached out and mentored and brought out the best within Timothy. He saw a gifting there. And that's the way that God worked in his life. And I believe it's a great example for how God can if we allow him to work within our own lives. And when I ponder this, it kind of goes against what we've been uh, working through as a church over the last few months. And I'm talking about the church nationwide. We've been 
encouraged or demanded not to gather together. So we've been resorting um, to online methods of sharing the word, and that can provide lots of encouragement, lots of instruction, lots of great things can be learned. But through that format, it is really difficult, if not impossible, to do the job of mentoring, to come alongside somebody, to see the giftedness that that person has, to encourage that, to mold it, help it to grow to what God wants it to become, and then have that person take over and influence that into the lives of somebody else. See, it's not just enough for me to be blessed. It's not just enough for me to be forgiven. It's not just enough for me to be encouraged. I'm made complete when I take that gifting that God pours into my life and I pour that into the lives of other people around me. Now, to get to that first place, I had to have people in my life that mentored and encouraged me. Um, I shared about it a little bit. It's more and more in recent days I've thought about the man who's now up celebrating with Jesus. His name was Ron Penrose. He brought me under wing when I was just a new Christian just a few months along. And he was patient with me. He gave me lots of encouragement. And he really partnered with the Holy Spirit in my life. Because I can remember some of the times when I was going through something and my checkup with him, he'd be like, well, I can see that God is doing A, B, C, and D in your life. And it's like, dude, I don't even get to tell you. Yeah, you're 100% accurate because God was speaking through him unbelievably. But many of the things that are good about me today are the direct result of the influence of that godly man. Um, He was truly like a dad to me in many ways. We spent a lot of time together. One of the things that we did together for encouragement was we'd go golfing. Um, Neither one of us was very good, um, but uh, we had a good time doing that. And then we'd get to the clubhouse afterwards and share lunch, and that's where so much of the ministry was put into my heart and life. And so it's something that I want to do is pouring back into the lives of other people. Um, can't do it with everybody. because, um, But we need to find one or two others for our lives to reach into, to see the God-given potential, and to bring it out. Um, we get to partner with the Holy Spirit in doing that in the lives of people around us. Um, I know that there have been a few people in my life that have credited with me with doing that for them, of seeing something there, being that encouragement, being that hope, or even challenging them to step out in an area and find out that it's like, wow, I really love that. Um, There's a a two-fold goal that I would share, and I've put it the questions. uh, We're going to be doing breakout groups, I believe, in a minute or two. Okay, pastors, and confirm that. So two questions to share. First, who has encouraged you? Because if you're like me, you have had somebody or maybe a few people. It's not every single Christian. You can say, yeah, I've been blessed by everybody. But who has really impacted your life in a way that you walk away saying, I really want to be like that? Who has encouraged you? But a tougher question, the one that uh, I struggle with more lately, is who are you encouraging? So as we go to the uh, breakout groups, those are the two questions to share. Who has been an encouragement to you, and who are you encouraging in return? And so at this time, let's send, head off to those little groups for discussion. We'll see you back in a few minutes. The Zoom folks are breaking out. Do have a few extra things to share with those that are uh, dialed in via Facebook? A few more examples from the Bible, because I can't think of any better source to go. The Bible is much more reliable than myself in my life. Um, One example is Moses, the great leader of the people of Israel. In his life, when he first was called to serve God, he felt unqualified and incapable And alongside, God sent his brother Aaron to encourage him. Because Aaron traveled um, traveled away from Egypt 
to come meet uh, jo Moses at Mount Sinai. And, uh, the, and God told Aaron, uh, Moses, he said, your brother is coming to meet you. He can speak well. He can do what you can't do. I'm going to send him to be your partner. So Aaron came alongside, and together those two brothers went. They confronted Pharaoh. They spoke to the people of Israel. They grew together a mighty army because God was with them. But then later Moses had a sidekick named Joshua, son of Nun. And one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is where it talks about that daily Moses would go into the tabernacle, meet with God face to face, and he would come out literally glowing with the glory of God on him. And it said that Moses would put a veil over his face and then he would go on back to his own tent. But Joshua, son of Nun, stayed there in that tent in the presence of God at all times. He wouldn't leave the tent. Um, so, he, so through Moses' influence, Joshua learned to spend time in the very presence of Almighty God. Another uh, couple of great leaders is one prophet named Elisha. And uh, prior to Jesus coming along, he's uh, one of the ones that had raised somebody from the dead. Um, tremendous prophet. And he was one that instructed and led others. In fact, he established something called the School of the Prophets because he walked with God and wanted to encourage lots of people to follow in his footsteps so that they too could walk with God. But he was brought under wing by the great prophet Elijah. Their names are very similar, but Elijah is the one that walked with God and was called down fire from heaven. And at a certain point in time, when it was time for his life on earth to end, he didn't die. Instead, a chariot of fire uh, came, and he was swept up into heaven alive. A uh, tremendous miracle there. But he was the one that discipled Elisha, showed him many things. And Elisha was so inspired, he's like, I want a double portion of your spirit. I want to be just like you. Um, but then this, then after Elijah was in heaven, his servant Elisha continued on carrying forth the ministry. And he brought under wing an, an apprentice, if you would, named Gehazi. Somebody that got to see the messages that he saw, hear the things that, uh, he, that Elisha had to say. He was able to follow along in the footsteps day after day and being mentored in that. He made some mistakes along the way, but he got to witness some greatness. But I love the qualifications that the Bible records for the prophet Elisha. It says that his qualification to be trusted and respected as a prophet was that he was the personal servant. He poured water on the hands of Elijah. Is that humble servitude is what qualified him to be respected as a man of God. Things in the world system don't necessarily line up with the way things work in the kingdom of God. Our humility our service, our faithfulness actually matter a lot in the, in the kingdom of God. In the book of 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. When I see this uh, verse, it reminds me of the tremendous value that the Lord places upon our true fellowship, our true unity. As I stressed, and it matters so much to my heart that we are all created alike in the image of Almighty God, every one of us. Even those like myself that have zero musical talent, in God's eyes, I'm still equal. Um, he places tremendous value on that fellowship, that openness, that trust, that partnering and journeying together. And the reason that we can be together as one is because the blood of Jesus, his son, my Lord, cleanses us from all sin. There's not one of us that can claim perfection. We all fall short in many, many ways. We all have our limitations. We all get down and depressed at times. We all go through times of stress. But each one of us, in the image of God, honoring him and working and partnering together, we can 
be cleansed, be made whole, and be empowered together. That's the beauty and the power, again, of the unity that we truly have. True unity can only be found in the presence of Almighty God. And John chapter 15, verse 5 says, Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. There's a lot of folks in this world that really think that they have got it all figured out, that all they need to do is say the right encouraging words, and they are um, they are empowered to influence others. In fact, that's a phrase that I've only recently come across, that people are described as being influencers. And I didn't know that was a title. Um, I would prefer, personally, to be known as a person of godly character and integrity. It's not about the the uh, influence, because I believe that God, that character, that godliness will provide and produce the influence. Um, but there are many people that try to rise up in their own intellect, their own strength, their own talent, their own abilities. They try to rise up and say, I am somebody great, follow me. Um, and that works uh, really good for certain things like uh, athletic preparation. Um, I've seen some tremendous coaches um, that can bring out the very best. They can br- inspire other people to perform better than they ever could have themselves because they've got that, that gift of encouragement within them. They can see something there to identify the talents and the abilities. But within the kingdom of God, it's something different. It says that we are to remain in Jesus. And that the Lord um, within us will produce the fruit. We're not going to produce the fruit of our own strength. It is entirely dependent upon Jesus working in our lives and through our lives that we can do good things and bring about the real fruit. Because the fruit of God is fruit that will last. And that's what we really want. We want fruit that will last. And how are we doing on time? Oh, then I am under. So what I thought about this this week is that um, we face a struggle of our lack of connectedness. Yes, we can be encouraged. Yes, we can find reassurance. Yes, we can find some value. But it can't bring about the full fulfillment of what God wants to do in our lives. To really be all that God wants us to be, it is important for us to have true fellowship, true interaction, to not just be blessed, not just be encouraged, but to connect people to God in the first place. But also we need to be connected to each other. And we need to partner with God in the mentorship that helps identify, encourage, support, and bring out the God-given talents in the people around us. We are never meant to journey this life alone. We're meant to do it in partnership with each other and in partnership with the Holy Spirit. There's never a place that we could go that God is not already there. Um, And that's one of the things that is so neat to think about that when we uh, go to the grocery store and we run into somebody, we think, wow, what an amazing coincidence. But perhaps that's an orchestration of Almighty God that I like to refer to those as God incidences because the Lord knows things in advance. He knows the encounters that we're going to have. And, you know, there have been times that I've been directed to, you know, it's like, instead of going to Albert's, let's go to Vaughn's this time. And you get in there, run into somebody that hadn't expected to see, had no idea that they're going to be there. And you can walk away rejoicing. And I've done that many times saying, Thank you, Lord. It was great to see so-and-so there. Um, Simple little things like that is God continuing to move because my life should intertwine with other people because when I need some encouragement, they can provide it for me and I can provide that encouragement for others. But as I shared very clearly, I didn't become the person I am without the interaction, without the support, without the encouragement of somebody that spoke into my life. And the amazing thing to me is that Ron's life continues to speak into mine, 
even though he's been in heaven with Jesus for a few years, I find the encouragement and the joy from uh, from uh, being inspired by him. Um, so that I would encourage you, and uh, as we go to close, is that um, think about who has been a great blessing and encouragement in your life. Who has seen something in you that you didn't see in yourself and helped to bring that out. But also, to fulfill all that God wants to do in you. Who do you have in your life that you can be an encouragement to? And if you don't really have it right now, be on the lookout. Be praying, saying, okay, God, who do you want me to equip? Who do you want me to strengthen and encourage? Because God wants to do something amazing through each and every one of us. As I've heard many times, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We are, every one of us, a sinner saved by God's grace. And each one of us can make a difference in the life of the people around us. And it requires commitment. It re requires faithfulness. And it requires real partnership with Almighty God to make it happen. So we're going to close in a word of prayer. And I do thank you for joining in. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege. Lord, I receive such a blessing through one man's life that touched me deeply and continues to touch me because I knew I was loved and I was valued and there was somebody that saw something in me, something worthwhile, something worth investing in. Lord, help me to be that same kind of man to the people around me. Father, help us to be willing to listen and learn from the people around us, to gain in uh, godly encouragement in shaping and molding, but also, Lord, grow us together to be a force for you in mentoring and encouraging other people to be a blessing in their lives so that together we can grow into the image of Almighty God, being all that you would have us to be. We thank you for your work. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. So thank you, folks. Thanks for dialing in. Oh, and I did have a slide to say that, actually. Had a very special one. It's not working. But it said, thank you, friends. Have a wonderful evening. And we will see you two services this Sunday, 9 a.m. and 1030 here at Palmdale Lighthouse. God bless you. You want this one? All right. So, folks, I'm still mic'd. Pastor Brent's going to get one because he wants to talk with y'all because he loves you. Can any of you guys hear me? Pastor Tim, can you hear me? Ah. Okay. I can see lips moving, but I can't hear anything. There we are. Hey, everybody, can you hear me? Hi, everybody, welcome back. Can you guys hear me? Is that sound? Yes? Can you guys hear me? This is uh, Pastor Brent. Can you guys hear me? It's not lighting up. Oh, there you are. Okay. My apologies on the uh, uh, the internet quality and such. We've been uh, since we've been trying to go here early prior to this. The internet has been extremely slow. We could get some things going, but everything was just at a crawl. So uh, we apologize, but we're glad that you connected. Were you guys able to?
spend uh, any of the time together in your group breakout sessions? No? Linda's given us hand signals of three minutes. Is that what you're saying, Linda? We're going to play three people. Three people, we're good. Yeah, if you hit your unmute button, you can do it, but. <laughs> all right, we're playing charades with Linda, so as soon as you can figure out what Linda's saying, let's all chime in and say, what is she uh, trying to portray, an animal? Yeah. Can you unmute her, Luke? Sometimes you can do a general unmute. She can, it's bottom right, Linda, usually on the screen. You know? Okay. So d try to reset, reset it. Do it again. Uh, see if we can do it on our end. Linda says that she's blocked. That's that's because it's on purpose, Linda. We're blocking you. We purposely don't want to hear anything from you. No, that's not true at all. Oh, no, don't get, don't get mad. Oh, man, she went off. Oh, no. That was supposed to be a joke. Now I have to find repair bridge with my sister-in-law. No, I can hear you, Angel. There we go. <laughs> you have to schedule your spa appointment with Angel to go up there. You have a moving sale coming up too, right, Angel? She has, a, she has a jacuzzi for sale, a couple of dogs for sale, and a husband for sale. So all of those things are. Sorry, did you say something, Chris? Okay. Okay. So we'll keep praying for you. <laughs> <laughs> 